So yes, welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our MOSS session. Uh, today we're going to be discussing uh, monarch butterfly conservation, and we are very lucky today to be joined by Katie Lynn Bunny, who is the education coordinator for the Monarch Joint Venture. Uh, they are a nonprofit organization working to conserve monarch butterflies and other pollinators, and they are working to build national partnerships that implement science-based conservation actions and promote a unified effort to conserve uh, the monarch migration. Katie Lynn uh, coordinates several of their education programs, including teacher professional development and local outreach, and she also works to connect partners and the public to resources that they may need for monarch conservation and education. So we wanna thank so Katie Lynn so much for joining us today. I will go ahead and turn things over to her uh, to do our presentation. Thanks, Amber. Hi, everybody. It's good to be here today. I'm excited to share all things monarchs with you. Uh, I'm going to turn my camera off for the presentation portion, but I will turn it back on um, as soon as I'm done presenting so um, you can uh, answer or ask questions. Um, okay, so. Like Amber said, um, I'm here today to talk about monarch butterfly conservation and some simple steps that you can make to take uh, to take action and make a difference for monarchs and other pollinators. Um, monarchs hold the hearts of many, and I'll get more into that in a little bit here. But um, the the monarch life cycle is probably something that's familiar to most people, being uh, you know, the general monarch or the general butterfly life cycle from egg, larva, pupa, and adult. But what makes monarchs unique is the fact that they only have one host plant, and that's milkweed. And monarchs can use any species of milkweed, and Minnesota has somewhere between 12 and 14 species, depending on what list you look at. Um, and they use any of them as their host plant, but it, they only um, eat plants from this group of, of uh, eat leaves from this group of plants. So every single monarch that you have ever seen started its life on a milkweed plant. And without milkweed, we don't have monarchs. It is their only host plant. If you're looking for monarch eggs or caterpillars, uh, you can find those on the underside of the leaves usually. Although, as you can see in this picture here on the right, uh, you'll, you'll see, um, use my little laser pointer here, there is a monarch egg right here on these flower buds, this cluster of flower buds um, on this milkweed plant. Monarchs go through several stages of development um, apart from just egg, larva, pupa, and adults. They shed their skin five times as, um, as larvae, so they hatch from an egg and then uh, molt five times into what we call instars, I-N-S-T-A-R. Uh, so monarchs have five separate instars uh, or separate stages of larval development, and it only takes about two weeks to go through all of them. So they'll, they'll hatch from their eggs, start eating milkweed, and then every few days they'll shed their skin and into the next instar. And then at the end of those two weeks, they uh, shed one more time and um, form their chrysalis. And their chrysalis is usually found uh, not on the milkweed plant. They usually leave the milkweed plant to find uh, to find a safe place to form their chrysalis um, and pupate. Um, I have found both of these um, the same summer, actually. <laughs> I haven't seen one um, outside the side of my house, um, the siding of my house uh, since then, but um, this J was formed on a plant that was next to milkweed, and then this pupa formed on a blade of grass next to um, next to a field of prairie, essentially. Um, they're the only two wild pupae or almost pupae I've ever seen in the wild, um, and I don't anticipate on seeing a whole lot more of them. <laughs> um, they're very hard to spot um, for a variety of reasons. So from the time they're ready to form their pupa to the time the pupa forms, it really only takes just a handful of minutes for that process to happen. But then they stay in their pupa for about another two weeks. And when they're ready to emerge or eclose, their pupa, um, it doesn't actually go clear, uh, but it does change color. And it's actually the monarch butterfly underneath that's changing color. It's not the outside portion um, or the, the casing of the pupa. 
But when they're when they're ready to emerge from their pupil casing, um, you can start to see the black and the orange of their wings show through. Um, and you can, if you get the get the chance, watching this only takes again a few seconds um, for it to completely come out of the pupil casing. And then it takes a you know maybe twenty to thirty minutes for their wings to fully inflate. But it takes several hours for their wings to dry for them to be able to fly. Um, this is a very vulnerable stage for them. The pupa, the pupa is completely immobile. They can't move. Um, once, especially once they're hardened, they might twitch a little bit in this stage here, you know, maybe trying to ward off predators or things like that, but they can't actually move from this spot. They're stuck there. Um, and then since they can't fly, their only defense as an adult is their bright coloration and, um, essentially trying to literally walk or run away from any predators that might come across them. Um, but they're, they're meant to fly, so uh, they're not very fast on their feet. Um, so if a predator finds them in any of these stages, they're, they're basically sitting ducks. Um, but those who do survive to adulthood can live anywhere between two to four weeks. So from the time the egg hatches to the time they form an adult, that, that's about a month, give or take a few days. And then as an adult here in Minnesota in the summertime, they live anywhere between two to six weeks, depending on various resources and, and other um, stressing factors on their population. Um, the male is on the left, or sorry, on the right here, the female is on the, on the left. Uh, you can tell the difference between the male and the female butterflies by looking for these dots on their hind wings. Um, those indicate that it is a male. The female also has more of a dull color and wider veins on their wings. However, that's really difficult to tell if you're only seeing one butterfly. Um, it's much easier to, to see that when you're looking at a male and a female side by side. Right now, we are experiencing the spring migration and breeding for monarch butterflies. Monarch butterflies spend their winters in Mexico. It's not like they're on the beaches of Cancun or anything like that. They are up in the mountains of central Mexico. It's it's not really that much warmer there than it is here. I mean, it doesn't get to 50 below, uh, but it does get to just below freezing. Um, there can be rain and snow and things like that that happen. Um, but they spend their winters in Mexico from November through March. And so right now we're hitting the, the, the last bit of the migration here, um, in Minnesota monarchs have just returned. All of my coworkers here in Minnesota have all spotted, um, either adult monarchs or milkweed or sorry, or, um, eggs on milkweed and things like that. So it's happening. Monarchs have returned to at least the Southern half of Minnesota, uh, for the summer. Um, but it took them a couple months to get here. So monarchs that have overwintered in Mexico leave somewhere around the beginning of March, migrate northward into the southern part of the U.S. here, um, laying eggs along the way. And then those adult monarchs who were overwintering die and their offspring, the eggs that they laid, continue the migration northward into the northern parts of their breeding range up here in the southern parts of Canada and the rest of um, the eastern part of the US. There's a similar migration in California. Um, it's shorter in scale, but um, not any less magnificent because of it. Um, monarchs on the west side of the Rocky Mountains overwinter on the coast of California. Um, they tend to lay most of their eggs in the Central Valley and then spend the summers, again, still breeding and laying eggs up in the mountains or the foothills. Um, and I know this map isn't exact, but it's close enough for my purposes. Um, and then they'll, they'll repeat the, the reverse journey um, in the fall. So here in Minnesota, um, we have the second and third generations of monarchs breeding um, and sometimes a fourth generation breeding between May and August. So this is the final generation of the summer before that's overwintering. And then the eggs that they lay are first generation monarchs. And then we have those monarchs offspring starting here. So the, the eggs that I have on my milkweed out in the front of my house right now, um, I found two of them yesterday, which was very exciting. Um, those are the grandchildren of the monarchs that overwintered in Mexico this past winter.
Oh, it's not clicking forward for me. There we go. Okay. So then in the fall migration, the reverse happens, although no or or much less breeding occurs. So in August here in Minnesota, monarchs will start to leave and fly south. Most of them won't breed. Most of them will go straight to Mexico, stopping to nectar along the way. As you can see in the photos here, they'll roost. Um, some of you may have experienced that um, in your own backyards or nearby monarchs clustering up in trees um, at night during the fall migration between August and September, late August and, and early September. And then by the beginning of November, most of the monarchs will have made it to central Mexico to their overwintering sites. And those are the, the final generations of the year. So that last generation is actually physiologically different from the monarchs that we have laying eggs and breeding here during the summer. Outwardly, they look identical, uh, but inwardly, they are um, sexually immature. So they're in what's, they're in a state of reproductive diapause. And that means that they are delaying reproduction until conditions are more favorable for it. So if you think to what late August and early September looks like, most of the plants are starting to go dormant, milkweed is starting to yellow, things are getting cold. Monarch butterflies cannot survive our winters here in Minnesota. So their strategy is to migrate and find a place where they can survive until the milkweed returns again in the spring. And so that's what they do. They spend their winters in Mexico. And then as things start to get warmer, as the sun gets higher in the sky, the angle of the sun increases, um, the days get longer, things like that. Then they start to migrate and come out of diapause. They start to breed, finding milkweed along the way and, and um, coming northward. Well, monarchs are overwintering in Mexico, they're not really doing much. Both of these images are from uh, the same sanctuary, El Rosario in central Mexico, just outside the town of Angangueo um, in the state of Michoacan. So monarchs will, um, you know, like I said, it, it's relatively cool. Um, most of us wouldn't say it's cold for a winter, but um, it, it's to, to a Minnesota mindset, it's a generally mild winter, but for most other people, I think they would say it's cold. Um, but butterflies and most insects need to be above a certain temperature in order for their muscles and particularly their flight muscles to work. And so monarchs on the cooler days when it's below 55 degrees and it's not sunny, it's cloudy, they are just roosting here up in the trees waiting for the sun to shine on them and warm them up a little bit. Um, and it's part of this, part of this is why they can live so much longer. So these monarchs are in reproductive diapause, which helps them live longer because mating and breeding is a relatively energy um energy heavy endeavor it takes a lot of energy and and resources to mate and then lay eggs um and so that's one reason they live longer but the other reason is that they're going to a place that literally cools down cools them down and slows their metabolism down so they're not able to move around a whole much unless things start to warm up um, which also keeps them from using all of the the fat stores and and the lipids that they've saved up during their migration and so when it's sunny out, they might leave the trees, they might fly around a bit, uh, they might go find water to drink, but there's not a lot of nectar, there's not much um, for them to eat there. So they need to build up enough fat stores for them to survive for the winter. It's not true hibernation, um, at least in, in the sense of like a bear or, or other organisms might hibernate, but um, it is essentially kind of what they're doing. They're they're going to sleep for a little bit because the temperature forces them into that state. If it gets too warm, they start flying around too much looking for food um, that they can't find because it's not there. And then they burn through all of those fat stores and won't survive the winter. So it's kind of this Goldilocks temperature that they're looking for that they're um that they found in these overwintering sites. And the same conditions exist in coastal California. So just to recap the migration, because I know it can be a little bit confusing, um, from August to November, monarchs are migrating. The final generation, generations four and five, are migrating south to Mexico or on the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains, southwest to central or to coastal California. They spend November through March overwintering in those sites, roosting up in trees, waiting for conditions to be right again to breed. And then in the spring, 
usually at the end of February or beginning of March. They start breeding, laying eggs along the way as they migrate north. Those butterflies that laid eggs reach the end of their lifespan, they die, and their offspring grow up to continue the migration northward. So here in Minnesota, we're seeing at the very least the children of the monarchs that overwintered in central Mexico, but more likely the grandchildren, especially if you're seeing if your first monarch of the year is an egg or a caterpillar, it's the grandchildren of the monarchs that overwintered. We see two to three breeding generations here in Minnesota. Um, we see a peak of egg laying here in late May and early June, another peak of egg laying in July, and then another bump in August. And there's a lot of overlap, especially in those final two generations of the summer, but it's the final generation of uh, monarchs that hatch in August that begin the migration southward again. Those are the super generation of monarchs that spend the winter in Mexico. Monarchs are unique in their migration because they all go to the same place in a relatively small space of time uh, or uh, generally small area, at which makes it easy to estimate their population. So I know here in the North, we are accustomed to seeing kind of frostbitten trees, right? Um, evergreens that might get a little bit rusty colored because it got too cold and they just couldn't handle it. Uh, but that's not what's happening here. These are OYAMEL fir trees, O-Y-A-M-E-L, fir trees. Um, so they, they look like any, any other fir tree um, that we might have here in Minnesota in general, it's the general shape of it, but they're not frostbitten. These these trees are orange because they're covered in monarch butterflies. Um, this picture was taken in the 1980s by Dr. Lincoln Brower um, from a, a helicopter. Uh, we don't often see colonies this size anymore, and I'll talk about that in just a minute here, but I wanted to kind of point out just kind of the, the magnificence of what this could potentially look like again if we, if we do our job and get it right. Um, Monarchs, monarchs are one of the most spectacular migrations in the world. Um, and so when we see all of these monarchs in one place, it makes it really easy for us to estimate the number of, um, the number of monarchs in a population. Now for monarchs in Mexico, we do that by how much space they take up. Um, this is the, the population graph since 1993 to 1994, so just about 30 years now um, of data. And I, I'm going to pause here for just a few seconds to let you look at this graph, and then I'll explain it a little bit. And as you're looking at it, I'd like you to think about the story that this graph might be telling. Um, and you don't have to put anything in the Q&A or anything like that. I just, just think to yourself for a minute here while I take a sip of water. And think about what this story, the story that this graph is, is telling us. Okay, so I'll explain what this graph looks like. Um, the, the bottom axis is the, the years, the winters, you know, like winter of 2007 and 2008. And then on the Y axis, it's the total forest area occupied by monarch colonies in hectares. So each of these bars represents um, a total number of hectares that monarchs occupied in Mexico during the winter season that it's resting above. The most winter winters, the most recent winter season of 2022 to 2023 is they occupied 2.21 hectares. Um, and in general, the this number is trending downwards. I don't need to put a trend line in here to for people to see that monarchs are declining. The eastern population of monarchs are declining. Um, I'm also going to pull up the graph of the West, even though here in Minnesota, we don't have Western monarchs. Um, it's still important to think about them because they are still part of the same North American population of migratory monarchs. So Western monarchs, I'll explain this graph as well. The bottom axis, the X axis is again, the year, um, and it, it doesn't include like, so this 
2022 is the winter of 2022 and 2023, if that makes sense. And then the Y axis is actually the total number of monarchs reported. There are and always have been fewer monarchs in California overwintering, so it's a little bit easier to estimate the total population uh, by individual. And it's also easier to access the sites in California. The mountaintops in Mexico are very remote um, and very wild and very steep, so it's difficult to get around and, and count individual trees um, or individual monarchs on the trees there. But the added thing that this Western monarch uh, population graph has is the number of sites that are monitored, and that's represented by these blue lines here. So you can see that apart from the three years between 2018 and 2020, the population remained for the most part around, you know, 100,000 to 300,000 ish monarchs. Um, but the number of sites volunteers went to to count that many has increased over the last 15 ish years or so. Um, and so that's another thing to consider. Um, monarchs may be using more sites. It's also possible that we, we didn't know about these sites or, or some of these sites in the previous 15 years to that. Um, but it, it, it is concerning, especially when you look at the years 2018, 2019, and especially 2020. Um, on this scale, we weren't even able to get the number of monarchs to represent on the graph, which is why I have this arrow here that uh, points to the fact that there were 1,914 monarch butterflies counted in overwintering sites in California the winter of 2020. That year really sucked for a number of reasons, um, and this was just a small part of that. Uh, I'll talk more about the reasons for the decline in just a second here, but I wanted to also talk about the work that's being done to conserve monarch mo the monarch's butterfly population and their um, conservation. So this has been going on for you know 50 years or more, um, and and keep in mind too this is a very Western white perspective on monarch conservation. Um, Ken Brueger and Catalina Trail, and this is in quotations, discovered the, the Mexico overwintering sites under Dr. Fred Urquhart with the Insect Migration Association, which was the first iteration of tagging for monarch butterflies. And the reason the word discovered is in quotation marks is because the people who live and, and work in, and reside in those areas of Mexico that monarchs overwinter knew that the monarchs were there. It's just that Dr. Urquhart's work brought that to the global view um, to the rest of the world. Um, and so that kind of kickstarted this timeline of all of the work that's been and is still happening for monarch butterflies. Um, a lot of that work really kicked off in the 1990s with um, science and conservation efforts beginning um, MJV formed in 2008 with the formation of the North American Monarch Conservation Plan. 2014 is when a petition was issued to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, to list the monarch butterflies under the Endangered Species Act. And the Obama administration also issued a president presidential memorandum that included provisions for monarch butterflies for habitat and things like that. Um, lots of other things have been happening since then. Um, we have several monarch conservation strategies that have been released um, since then. The Monarch Conservation Science Partnership had several papers that were critical in informing conservation strategies and targets that happened in that time period. And a lot of that kicked off with this petition. And then um, I'll talk about this in a second um, under the Endangered Species Act, but I wanted to address something that came out last summer first. The monarchs were listed under the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Um, they were listed on the IUCN's red list as endangered. This is not the same as listing under the U.S. Endangered Species Act, and the listing on the red list does not provide any protections or regulatory authority. 
So it is different, but the IUCN experts conducted similar assessment, uh, assessments of the status of the monarch species, and the results are consistent with the ESA status assessment, which we'll talk about in a second. And the listing on the IUCN red list doesn't, um, doesn't affect how we continue to do conservation for monarchs and other pollinators. With the endangered species listing, and I know a lot of people are learning a lot about how this process works with such a, a charismatic and and popular insect as monarchs. Um, but in 2014, they were petitioned, and a 90-day finding um, from the Fish and Wildlife Service determined that it warranted looking into. Um, and so, in 2015 through 2018, a species status assessment was conducted which looked at all sorts of things, um, pulling data from all sorts of sources. Um, a lot of landmark papers were published during that time period, um, and all of the data have gone into a monarch conservation database. And then in December of 2020, monarchs, uh, it was announced that monarchs um, weren't listing under the Endangered Species Act, but they are precluded by other higher priority species. Um, now, they have been going under a review, um, an annual review since then, and they are expected to be listed in the fiscal year of 2024. And for federal government, the fiscal year starts in October of 2023. So we could have a decision on whether or not monarchs um, will be listed officially under the Endangered Species Act as early as October of this year, uh, but it's coming. Um, we will have that decision soon. Um, and so there's a lot of a lot of information um, and a lot of questions about this. And Amber, if you want to pull the, the ESA link, um, we have an FAQ on our website um, that we'll put in the chat um, about the endangered species listing and the process and what that means for monarchs and you can find more information there um, but what it's really looking at is um, this quasi extinction risk and so a quasi extinction uh, and this is probably a new term to a lot of people um, it's the point at which extinction is inevitable um, and essentially at that point the population is below a point that the species can recover um, it, it's kind of you know, sad to think about this kind of thing, but the, the risk for monarchs um, is pretty high. Um, and, and it's measured by at what point of the population measurement would monarchs would reach that. And it's estimated to be at 0.01 to 0.25 hectares. And, and like I said, the risk of reaching it is high. Uh, by 2025, which is just a couple of years away, the risk is anywhere between three to 42%. And by 2075, it's between 48 and 69 percent. And I know those are huge ranges, but it's it, this is such a complicated population that it's somewhat difficult to measure that. Um, for Western monarchs, the risk uh, threshold is between 20,000 and 40,000 monarchs, and the risk for that is so high that we've seen it three years in a row. <laughs> um, so. And we could see it again, um, truthfully. So when we think about this quasi extinction risk and, and what our target should be, the question comes up, do we aim to have our target for monarch populations at those levels? And really, the answer is probably not. Um, we don't really want them to be there because those levels are so precariously precariously low already, they would literally be balancing on the edge of extinction. And we want to avoid that. And we want to keep them at levels that can withstand some ups and downs in population, which are totally normal. Even within the, the decline that's been happening, there have still been ups and downs. So we want monarchs to thrive through poor weather, um, gains and losses of habitat, fluctuations in disease level, predation, things like that the natural pressures that populations face. So we want them comfortably higher than the quasi extinction levels. So for Western monarchs, that's 500,000 monarchs overwintering um, on average each year in California. And for Eastern monarchs, that's at six hectares. Um, and 
we can get there. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about what what things we should be worrying about and the things we should not be worrying about. Um, I'll start with the things we should not be worrying about so much. And those are natural threats. These are things that monarchs have um, existed and coexisted with for millennia. Things like uh, predators, diseases, parasites. Monarchs have many natural causes of death and only about two to 5% of the eggs that are laid actually make it to adulthood. And that's normal. That's very normal for any organism that lays a lot of eggs. Um, that's why they lay so many eggs to ensure that some of them will actually survive to adulthood. Um, and so you don't need to go around saving every single monarch that you see. Um, you don't need to worry about picking pests off your milkweed plants. It's normal to have that sort of predation. Um, we cannot conserve one species at the expense of others and everything's got to eat. Um, that includes the predators for monarch butterflies. Now, the one caveat to this, I will say, is that there are concerns that invasive species are having an effect on monarch butterflies like paper wasps. Um, and there's more research coming out of that. Um, but in general, things like spiders and ants and, and things like that um, are going to predate on monarchs um, no matter what we try to do. Um, short of putting them in a bubble, which isn't healthy for them or the ecosystem, uh, things will eat monarchs. Um, if you're looking to help with predation in your garden, work towards having a more diverse ecosystem there. And I'll talk about that more in a second too. The things we should be worrying about are loss of breeding habitat, um, pesticide use, and climate change. The loss of breeding habitat and hotter weather have been associated with lo lower monarch populations. Um, those are the things that we need to be concerned about, and those are the things that we can have the greatest impact for monarchs. If we reduce and, and more responsibly use pesticides, um, increase habitat and decrease the loss of habitat and mitigate the effects of climate change, those will have the greatest impact on monarch butterflies. Um, the stochastic ecological events, um, you know, more severe winter storms, fire, drought, those things are happening more often and more severely um, it, all, over, all over North America, all over the world. Uh, we're also still losing habitat to development. Some of that is agricultural land, but some of it's also to develop um, housing, uh, you know, housing developments and cities and things like that. So um, if we can put habitat back into some of these places through gardens, through uh, the strips program that Iowa is using, um, through, you know, boulevard gardening or, or, container gardening on balconies and things like that. We can put some of that habitat back into the landscape that it was removed from. And I know a lot of the things that I have just talked about can be very depressing, especially on a lunch hour as spring is coming, um, but I'm, I'm going to end this on a hopeful note. Um, there are a lot of people working on this. Oops. Uh, the Monarch Joint Venture is a partnership of over 120 organizations all working to conserve the monarch butterfly and its migration. Um, there are so many people working on this and not everybody that's working on it is even listed as a partner here. They're not necessarily official partners of MJB. Um, you know, especially when you think of all the individuals that are doing things like planting habitat, um, advocating for monarchs, um, you know, collecting data on on monarchs across the country and across the the, the continent, um, lots of people are doing their part already. So, it, it it can be really easy to feel alone in this sort of work, but you're not alone. There are lots of people working on this, even in Canada and Mexico. Monarchs are a tri-national um, species. They migrate across um, three countries and many nations in between, um, and and. Every one of us is doing what we can um, right now with, with the resources that we have to help monarchs and increase habitat. Um, and the other thing that I'll note is that someone somewhere is monitoring a part of the monarch life cycle at any given point in the year. And I'll explain more about how you can get involved in that as well. Um, zoos and aquariums are doing their part using um, the Monarch Safe program, saving animals from extinction. Um, getting the word out to their uh, staff and their visitors to do their part to increase habitat and and um, the likelihood that monarchs will 
survive into the next generation. There are many, many, many plans out there to help uh, strategy strategize for monarch conservation. The mid monarch the mid America monarch conservation strategy goes and goes through to twenty uh, sorry twenty thirty eight um, with the Midwest Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. Um, 1.3 billion milkweed stems, an average um, colony size of six hectares in Mexico. It includes goals, strategies, and existing efforts broken down by states and identifies who is going to do what part of the work for the next, you know, 25, uh, or sorry, 15 years or so. Um, it includes all of the states in green there um, and, and what their goals are as well. MJV also has our own implementation plan that um, can help inform not just agencies and organizations, but individuals as well. Um, you can find that on our website as well. Um, it, we were at one point, oh, sorry, we were at one point updating it annually, um, but we've gotten to the point where um, updates weren't really needed. We know that the work still needs to happen um, and we will adjust when we learn more about the the things that need to get uh, get done to help monarch butterflies. So on to what you can do. You're already starting. You've already started exploring and learning more about monarch butterflies, um, learning more about what you can do to help them. Being a part of this webinar is the first step. Uh, many of you have are, may already be doing um, some of this work as well. The Monarch Joint Venture is a really great resource for information um, on learning more about what you can do for monarchs and other pollinators. We're kind of a, an information clearinghouse, um, so you can find information based on the type um, of work that you're looking to do or who your audience is. Um, you can find information conservation education resources on our website. Um, you can find information particular to science or habitat under our programs page. Our resources page has lots of downloads and links, handouts and things that you can uh, print off or order. We also have our own webinar series that's monthly. Um, it's free. Uh, it's on the, the fourth Tuesday of every month um, and uh, accepting November and December. Um, and you can find information for that on our website as well. Um, the next best thing and actually the best thing that anybody can do um, to help monarchs and other pollinators is to plant habitat and then explore it. Go have fun out there in your garden. Um, see what comes back to your yard after you've planted even just a, an additional plant. Um, I think you'll be amazed at the, the amount of biodiversity that will return to a space um, just by adding a few new plants to it. When you're planting for pollinators, you want to think about having a continuous bloom, something blooming at every point during the growing season. And that can be challenging in Minnesota because our growing season is so short, um, but there are things that are out there blooming right now um, and things that will bloom into June. Uh, but you also want to make sure that you have things blooming into October or sorry, not October, September. <laughs> October is a little bit too late, but you want to have things that are blooming into September because there are also pollinators still present and monarchs will be migrating and need that fuel to get south to Mexico. Having a diverse um, a diversity of native plants is also important. Um, diversity will help mitigate some of the competition that happens in your garden ecosystem. Um, and native plants are also what native pollinators are expecting to see and native pollinators and, and when you're thinking about butterflies and moths, um, what they might need for their host plants. So you want to think about host plants, nesting sites, nectar resources. Um, you can also think about other pollinators in terms of where they can nest and what they need um, in different stages of their life cycle. So ground nesting bees um, and, and pollinators uh, require bare patches of disturbed and undisturbed ground. Uh, leaving uh, stems from last year's plants up, uh, you know, you can cut them back 8 to 12 inches for cavity nesting bees, piles of sticks and dried grass and leaves um, for bumblebees, and then, of course, larval forage, host plants for, um, for pollinators, for uh, butterflies and moths. For monarchs, um, and I have, this is more on a national scale, but there's over 100 species of milkweed that are native to North America. So you want to look for what's native to your region um, in local native plant guides, plant guides. I've got several listed here, and I think Amber will put some in the chat. But the Xerces Society and Pollinator Partnership have regional plant guides. 
My favorite though is the National Wildlife Federation's Native Plant Finder. You can put in your zip code and it will populate a list of plants that are prioritized based on how available they are commercially, but also how beneficial they are to pollinators. And that includes host plants. Um, you can find local nurseries on MJV's vendor map. We've got so many here in Minnesota. There's a bunch here in the Twin Cities. You can see the cluster here on the map, um, but you can find some from all over. And MJV has just started selling plants uh, from Minnesota Native Landscapes on our store. Um, so you can pre-order them now and MNL will ship them out in June when conditions are uh, more, I guess, appropriate <laughs> for shipping plants. Um, so you can order those off of MJV's website and they're good for most of the Midwest states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois in general. Um, I'm mentioning tropical milkweed. Um, it's not native and it perpetuates disease and winter breeding. It's less of a concern if you're planting it in Minnesota because it's tropical and can't survive our winters. But if you have a home in another state, particularly along the Gulf Coast, Florida, the Southeast, or even in the West in California or one of the other Western states, or you have family that does, Try to encourage them to plant native, replace their native uh, or their tropical milkweed with native plants because there are so many concerns with um, tropical milkweed around disease and winter breeding that could be really um, detrimental to the monarch population as a whole. And I'm happy to share more information with you if you email me, um, but you can also find it on our website. The other thing to watch out for when you're purchasing plants is watching for treated plants um, with neonicotinoids in particular. Um, these um, can be applied to a plant um, or a seed before planting, um, and many of them, all of them actually, um, with neonics, they're systemic, so they stay with the plant for the duration of its life, um, and all parts of the plant then become toxic to invertebrates. Um, from the pollen to the nectar to the leaves. Um, so even if it's listed as a beneficial plant for monarchs or other pollinators, if it's been treated with a neonicotinoid, it's no longer beneficial and is doing more harm than good. Uh, but even just general pesticides, um, you wanna watch for those two and, and try to purchase plants that don't have them. Another really impactful way to contribute to monarch uh, conservation is to collect data for community science programs. I mentioned earlier that monarchs are one of the most heavily monitored organisms in the world, um, at least in North America. Someone somewhere is monitoring some part of the monarch life cycle at any given point in the year. These are just a few of the bigger programs here in Minnesota. Big ones to look for are Monarch Watch, that's the tagging in the fall. Journey North tracks the migration. The Monarch Larva Monitoring Project has roots here in Minnesota. It started at the University of Minnesota under Karen Oberhauser in the uh, mid to late 90s. Um, and that's looking at eggs and larvae on uh, milkweed plants. And then Project Monarch Health looks at diseases. Another one you could get involved with is the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program, but it's pretty intensive. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that, I'm happy to share details on it, but most people start with MLMP. Monitoring for monarchs has a lot of scientific benefits. Um, it allows researchers to answer questions that could never be considered using traditional academic research methods and the value to the research. It's added so much value to the research and our understanding of the species as a whole, um, especially because monarchs are an ecosystem indicator. If we're noticing even people who aren't necessarily involved in conservation are noticing that monarchs are declining, what else is out there is that's also declining that we're not seeing. Um, monarchs also, or monitoring for monarchs also has educational and conservation benefits. Um, so monitoring can be a really important conservation tool. Um, and I'll, I'll provide a little bit more information on that on the next slide. Um, monitoring also engages everyone of all ages in science and conservation and environmental stewardship. There's lots of learning opportunities that come up throughout monitoring and it can be really fun. Um, maybe not on, you know, the 100 plus degree days, but you can move it around and do it on a day that's less than 100 degrees. Um, but it can, it can be a lot of fun, um, and a way to kind of work together in your community to learn more about the monarchs in your space. We have learned a lot 
from Monarch Community Science data. Um, I alluded to that on the previous slide, but between 2000 and 2015, two thirds of field based research papers on Monarchs used data that were collected through community science programs, which is kind of astounding. Um, we've learned more about their natural history, their distribution, their migratory pathways, the timing of migration, their nectar and host plant resources, biology of parasitoids and parasites, um, survival rates of immature monarchs, the eggs and larvae and the pupae, and then, of course, the, uh, the impacts of threats and stressors on their population. Another great way to help monarchs is to connect and share. Um, we're starting with that here, but you can do that in your homes, in your communities, your workplace, your school, your faith, uh, your faith organization, churches, um, libraries, all sorts of things um, you can do within your community. Um, we can work together to protect monarchs and just know, ending on a hopeful note, we can make a difference for monarchs and other pollinators if we work together. This is an all hands on deck approach um, and we need everybody's help to get there. So with that, I will end on some questions. I think we have about 13 minutes. I'll turn my slides off, and my camera back on. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Katie Lynn, for, for just that wealth of information about what both scientists and citizens are doing. Um, it's, it's amazing just the progress in the last five years. Um, yeah. Yep. I, I know I've, I know that I've tossed a lot of information out there, so feel free to reach out with any questions. <laughs> um, I'm happy to answer them. I am heading into my busy season, so it's possible I might Put your question to one of my coworkers, but um, I'm more than happy to do what I can to to help you get the resources that you need. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I think we'll try and go ahead and and post your your uh, email address um, in the chat sure. for people who might have questions. Please do. But <laughs> but we do have uh, we do have a few minutes here to be able to answer a few of the questions that came into the Q and A. Um, Anna had a, one of the first questions, and that uh, she's noticing that her milkweed is obviously attracting some of those predators: flies, wasps, yeah. bees. Um, you know, other than diversification, is there anything that she can do to um, encourage more monarchs and and discourage some of those insects? Not really. Um, diversification is the key. Um, there, there's not really you can do that would not exclude things that you do want. You know, I know a lot of people who you might try to put a net over their milkweed or pull the milkweed out of the the space or the monarchs off the plant or something like that. But that's kind of messing with the balance of the ecosystem, right? Kind of playing God in some respects. Um, but um, I will say for paper wasps, there have been some data recently that have shown that those can be a really big impact. So if you have paper wasps and can remove the nest, you should. Um, they're not um, they're not good for monarchs and they're not native. So um, you can um, you can definitely mitigate the effect with paper wasps. But with other things like I have spiders and ants in my yard and anything that I do to control them is also going to affect the monarchs themselves. So um, I would say just let nature take its course um, and do what you can to add more to your garden so that there's more for those predators to choose from. Um, Jeff had a question about, uh, well, Jeff and I guess Pam had similar questions about um, the potential for overwintering in, in the northern climates. Um, Jeff mm -hmm. is wondering if there's ever been any documented evidence of monarch, the adults or the larva overwintering and surviving in the northern hemisphere. And and Pam has actually mentioned that she um, she has found a, a chrysalis in her garden in the fall, and is wondering yes. if those are likely to hatch or if they'll even survive the winter. Great questions. Um, I'm going to answer the chrysalis one first. Uh, the chrysalis one is like, and we get questions about this every year. Um, those are likely just monarchs that weren't intended to make the migration for whatever reason. They didn't go into diapause. Maybe they didn't receive the right cues from the environment. So those chrysalises will not make it. They cannot survive a winter. Um, it gets too cold here for monarchs to survive. Um, it's just you know they don't have they don't have you know um, uh, blubber or <laughs> uh, hibernation strategies like other insects do. So they can't. They're not 
intended to overwinter here. They are a tropical species of butterfly technically. Um, so if you're finding monarch chrysalises in your garden, um, they won't survive the, the winter, unfortunately. Um, as for overwintering in the north, and technically Mexico is in the northern hemisphere, so I'm going to adjust my language to talk about, you know, in the United States and Canada. Um, it's unlikely because the conditions are so specific in central Mexico and coastal California um, that I, I'm not sure. Actually, um, I would say it's unlikely uh, monarchs have been migrating in these patterns for probably longer than human memory. Um, and so, or, or like generational human memory. Um, and so I won't say it's impossible because you never know what nature is going to do, uh, but it's highly unlikely that they will find a, a place in the United States or even Canada that they can overwinter. Um, that could change with climate change. We're hoping that climate change will slow down. Um, but I know a lot of folks have read flight behavior by, um, Barbara Kingsolver and it's a great book, but it's also fiction. Um, <laughs> it's based in science, um, and it's got a lot of scientific concepts in there that are accurate. Um, but it's, it's unlikely. I think that monarchs will find a, a different overwintering site. That said, there are some inland sites in Western in the Western US in uh, both California and Arizona that monarchs are overwintering in, but they have been documented for at least five to 10 years doing that. Um, and we're still learning more about it. There are, there are still so much that we don't know about monarchs and their migration and how they navigate and find places to do that. So it's not impossible, but unlikely. Okay. Um, and I had a question um, a little bit about um, like the citizen a citizen push for ordinances within their communities or within their cities. Um, is there any um, any suggested ways to adopt or encourage more urban gardening things around lawn height regulations or allowing wildflowers in places where they haven't been allowed in the past? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, one way to start um, is by container gardening. Uh, there are, even with prairie plants, there are some good ones that you can choose to plant in a container. Um, but in general, it's going to take a lot of conversation and a lot of listening. And it, it's not going to happen in most cases overnight or even within the same season. It could be potentially months or years working with the right people, building connections, building relationships. And I would say to go at it at, in a conversational tone and not an accusatory tone, because if you're accusing anybody of doing horrible things for pollinators by preventing this, it's just going to shut shut the conversation down before it can get really started. Um, so active listening um, and and asking questions and uh, on both sides is the key to getting that happening. Um, I know a lot of folks who are also struggling with HOA regulations. Um, we're working on pulling together some resources, but I can find, um, I know that there are ways around it. Um, even one of our board members lives in an HOA and she uh, took part in the Lawns to Legumes program a few years ago and everything that she planted is all native and still meets all of her HOA requirements. So there are ways around it. Um, and obviously every HOA is different, every city is different, but um, conversation um, and asking questions are, a, a great way to start that. Sure, those are great suggestions. I I particularly love the the container gardening aspect for those of us that are in you know pretty small urban yards. Mm -hmm. It it allows us to kind of move things around a lot more throughout the season um, and still yeah. still contribute. So. Um, a bit of an agronomy question from Amber. Um, she would like to plant milkweed on her property and has actually collected some milkweed seed. Um, and she's wanting to know if the seeds need to be cleaned of their fuzz um, or if the seeds need to be stratified before planting them. Yeah, they do need to be stratified and you'll find that the fuzz will just fall off eventually. <laughs> it doesn't stick on for very long. It's only meant to transport it to a place where it can germinate. But all plants in Minnesota from my knowledge, um, need to go through a stratification process. For milkweed, That's that tends to be just being cold for a while. <laughs> um, and so putting it either outside naturally, like I've kept mine in my garage, my uninsulated garage, um, or my shed. It's not always free from, you know, critters that might eat it, but um, putting them in a garage or a, um, a shed through the winter can do that. Uh, you can also find instructions 
really all over the internet on how to do that um, almost artificially by putting them in the freezer or the refrigerator uh, layered between damp paper towels um, for a few weeks and then they can germinate. Um, and a lot of it so is sometimes just kind of experimenting with uh, what works for whatever species you're you're working with. Um, Despite its reputation as a weed, it can be kind of difficult to get it to grow. <laughs> uh, once it's established, though, it's there for a, a few years, um, but getting it started can be challenging sometimes. Um, a couple of questions about uh, specifics related to, to milkweed. Um, you know, Parker is just asking for a little bit more information about the best resources to identify those best plants. Um, yeah. And Jesse just has Jesse just had a question about um, the native milkweeds um, and if there are alternatives just because of how they spread and how they can be really invasive um, within the individual garden spaces. Yeah, so um, the resources, like the, the Minnesota DNR website has great resources on native plants. Um, other resources are, you know, organizations like Wild Ones. Um, the University of Minnesota Extension has resources. Our website has resources. Um, there's there's lots out there. It's kind of exhausting and, and overwhelming in some cases. Um, but you can start with some native plant lists for your region. Your local extension office might have some specific to your county. Uh, soil and water conservation districts or boards can also be helpful. Um, and then in terms of alternatives to native milkweeds, there's not alternatives to native milkweeds, but there are some native milkweeds that you might choose over others. Common milkweed is going to spread and spread a lot. Um, it grows through rhizomes underground, um, so it's not necessarily going to stay where you plant it. Uh, but butterfly weed and swamp milkweed um, tend to be, and poke milkweed tend to be common ones that are still good, you know, easy, easy to find in commercial settings um, and grow well in most conditions. And they don't spread as much as common milkweed. Um, they tend to stay pretty contained where you plant them. Um, and then um, the other thing I'll say to that is if milkweed is growing in a place that you don't want it, you can pull it out. <laughs> if it's growing somewhere where you don't want it, you can pull it. Um, if there's monarchs on it and you're worried about them, you can set them next to a plant that's still in the ground. Um, but if it's growing outside of a garden path or across a fence or anything like that, you can go ahead and pull it or mow it down. That's totally fine. Um, there are no rules against that. I know a lot of people are, are worried about it because it's still food for monarchs. But if it's growing somewhere you don't want it, just like with any other plant, you can yank it out and put it somewhere else or just compost it. Um, that's totally fine. All right. Well, I, we are, I'm so excited. We have a ton of questions and I'm, I'm really sad that we won't be able to get to, to them all. Um, but again, <laughs> if you, if you want to reach out to Katie Lynn, um, you can certainly reach her um, through her, her, her contact information is available through the Monarch Joint Venture website. Um, she again is the education coordinator and so would be able to, to take on some of those questions. Um, but as we get ready to leave here for the day, I thought I would just ask the, this one final question. Um, as we get into the summer and um, a lot of the, the children's programming and, and adult programming alike, um, there's this practice of raising monarchs throughout the summer. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about some of the best practices. Parker in particular yeah. is, is asking about what's the best way to make sure that the, the adults are robust and healthy and ready for release. Yeah, so I, I'm, I know that we have a hard stop for the caption at one o'clock, so I'm going to say fast what <laughs> I recommend. Um, in general, if you are raising monarchs, you should also be contributing to a community science program like the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. Um, please do that <laughs> so we can learn about what you're what you're seeing, what you're experiencing, um, and only do a few, not hundreds, not dozens, just a few. Um, you want to make sure you're cleaning out the containers every day that each monarch is in an individual container, not only to help to prevent the spread of disease, but also to help keep track of individuals to report to a community science program. Um, we have resources on doing that on our website and the monarch Labor monitoring project website is also a great resource for that. But um, if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out. I was just scrolling through the questions that are left and I have answers to most of them. 
Um, so if you didn't get your question um, at, uh, answered, please reach out to either me or info at monarchjointventure.org and we will be happy to um, answer any questions that we didn't get to today. So, yeah, I know that was a very short answer to a very complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really appreciate that. You know, thank you so much for providing all these additional resources and, and ways for people to kind of reach out and learn more. Um, for individuals that have been on today's webinar, um, if you want to be able to share this with uh, other individuals within your, your group or, or your community, uh, we will be posting a recording to uh, the DNR's uh, education website um, in, in the coming days um, so that you can, you can share this with other individuals. Um, for those of you that are joining us regularly for the Moss series, we hope to see you next Wednesday where we're going to be talking about the secrets of the musky diet. Um, so as we get ready for summer fishing, we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about that particular fish. Um, but I want to thank Katie Lynn once again. Thank you so much for all this additional information and for the resources. And, uh, and with that, I think we'll stop the recording and we'll, uh, we'll head back into the back room.